The entrance of God's word gives light and it brings understanding to the simple. Even as you're about listening to this message by the man of God, we hope that the light of God's word will be shed abroad in your heart. You will know what to do and you will know how to live. And so if you're new to this channel, kindly hit on that subscribe button for us. And then like this message. Also go to the comment section and comment whatever you have learned. Share this message abroad because we won't always be a blessing to the world. I also want to welcome all the citizens around the world by way of various campuses, house churches, Bible study groups, clusters, those of you connected online. What a joy to have all of you connected. Guys, we're going to have a great time studying Christ and learning the truth concerning what Christ has made available to the believer. All right, tonight we're still looking at how to win in life. And we started this series and it's just been exciting just looking at God's word. Romans chapter 15 verse number 4. Romans chapter 15 verse number 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So we've been examining the voice of victory in how to win in life series. And we said what well, things soever were written aforetime, they were written for our learning. The word learning there is the word didaskalia, the word doctrine. Didaskalia is spelled as D-I-D-A-S-K-A-L-I-A, -A -A, didaskalia, which means doctrine or the same word for learning. So which means that when I read scriptures, what is the goal of reading scriptures? What am I aiming to achieve when I read the scriptures? What am I looking at when I look, read the scriptures? Where do I want to arrive at? What's my goal? Why do I read the scriptures? Well, the goal, of course, Paul is referring here to the Old Testament scriptures. When we read Genesis to Malachi, and the goal, he says, is to give me hope. And then Paul also indicates that part of my goal for reading the scriptures should be comfort. So it is for hope and for comfort. That's why I read the scriptures. Now the word comfort here is the word parakeleo. Parakeleo. It's P-A-R-A-K-E-L-E-O. Parakeleo. Now of course you remember Jesus in John 14, 16. John chapter 14 verse 16 jesus said and i will pray the father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever that word another comforter mm -mm. the word another comforter there is the word parakletos or paraclete and same root, root word with parakeleo so he said comforter three times in that chapter then again in first john chapter 2 verse 1 first john chapter 2 verse number 1 my little children these things write i unto you that you sin not and if any man sin we have an advocate with the father jesus christ the righteous so he uses another word there the word advocate then he calls the spirit and then he calls jesus in other words god is that comforter god is father son and holy spirit so father son and holy spirit is the comforter and it has its roots in genesis chapter 2 verse 18 genesis chapter 2 verse number 18 and the lord god said it is not good that the man should be alone i will make him and help meet for him i will make him and help meet for him the word help there is from the word ezar, E-Z-A-R in the Hebrew, which means helper. And God is the only one called helper throughout the Old Testament. No human being is your helper, not your husband, not your wife. The helper in biblical context is God himself. One who stands alongside to help you fight battles one who stands alongside to help you fight battles to assist you and to give you succor one who stands alongside with you to help you fight battles to assist you and to give you succor now 
so what it means here is that the scriptures actually reveals that work of god to us the scriptures actually reveal that work of god to us so when we read the scriptures we see that god grants us help when we read the scriptures we will see that it is god's responsibility and it has always been in god's character and nature to grant us help god is our helper that word parakeleo which is that word in romans 15 4 we will see that word again in luke chapter 2 verse 25 luke chapter 2 verse number 25 and behold there was a man in jerusalem whose name was simeon and the same man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of israel and the holy ghost was upon him that word consolation he talks about consolation the consolation of israel which is talking about the redemptive work which jesus came to accomplish so the consolation of israel is the redemptive work which god came to accomplish in luke chapter 6 verse 24 luke chapter 6 verse 24 but woe unto you that are rich for you have received your consolation the word consolation you have received your consolation that is if you are living well in this world that is where your consolation is if you are living well all right then acts chapter 4 verse 36 acts of the apostles chapter 4 verse 36 and joseph who by the apostles was so named barnabas which has been interpreted the son of consolation a levite and of the country of cyprus barnabas the son of consolation the same word parakeleo barnabas the son of consolation the word consolation means encouragement the word consolation means encouragement the son of encouragement then in acts of the apostles chapter 9 verse 31 acts of the apostles chapter 9 verse 31 then had the churches rest throughout all judea and galilee and samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy ghost were multiplied walking in the fear of the lord and in the comfort of the holy ghost we are multiplied so look records here again the comfort of the holy ghost the help of the holy ghost look at acts chapter 13 verse number 15 acts of the apostles chapter 13 verse number 15 and after the reading of the law and the prophets the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them saying ye men and brethren if you have any word of exhortation for the people say on the word exhortation if you have any word of exhortation there so the word exhortation there doesn't mean to give a short speech of two minutes because sometimes in our innovated interpretation of the word exhortation it looks like a very short speech let that brother come and exhort us no but the original biblical meaning for the word exhortation has to do with encouragement encouragement and if the god if god is the god of consolation the god of exhortation it cannot be the god of a short speech okay so exhortation there is encouragement look at acts of the apostles chapter 15 verse number 31 acts of the apostles chapter 15 verse number 31 mm -mm. acts of the apostles chapter 15 verse number 31 which when they had read they rejoiced for the consolation which when they have read they rejoiced for the consolation so the word consolation there is the word parakeleo which means to come to your assistance consolation means to come to your aid 
Consolation means to come to your help. In Romans chapter 12, verse number 8. Romans chapter 12, verse number 8. Or he that exhorted on exhortation. That's the word consolation there. He that exhorted on exhortation. So Paul uses the same phrase. He that exhorts on exhortation. Look at Romans chapter 15 verse 5. A lot of scriptures but good for your saintly dignity. Romans chapter 15 verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to christ jesus the god of patience and consolation so our god is a god of consolation which means like i said exhortation is not a short sermon exhortation actually means to bring to your remembrance what god is doing consolation means to bring to your remembrance what god is doing to call your attention or to remind you what god is doing you know paul's exhortation took hours it took hours so like i said that word exhortation is not a short speech now we read earlier that our god is called the god of hope he is also called the God of exhortation or the God of consolation. Look at Romans chapter 15 verse 5 again. Romans 15 5. Now the God of patience and consolation. That's our God. Grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. The God of patience and consolation. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. So God is called the God of exhortation. He doesn't mean the God of small speeches. No, like he have you know, like we have innovated today. Exhortation means God who comes to your aid. God who comes to your assistance. God does not abandon you. He is so mindful of you. He cares about you. And he has made himself the God who comes to your aid. And the God who comes to your assistance. In 1 Corinthians 14.3 where we read on prophecy... Brother Paul says, prophecy is for exhortation. Prophecy is for edification. And prophecy is for comfort. Now in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 to 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3 to 5. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of mercies. And the God of all comfort, oh glory to God, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the suffering of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by christ so this is very emphatic in god being one who gives consolation look at second corinthians chapter 7 verse number 4 second corinthians chapter 7 verse number 4 great is my boldness of speech toward you great is my glorying of you i am filled with comfort I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. I am filled with comfort in all our tribulation. Look at verse 7 of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 7 now. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, 
your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoiced the more. So Titus brought comfort and Titus brought consolation. Look at verse 13 of that chapter 7. Verse number 13. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus. Because his spirit was refreshed by you all. So, when we read scriptures, we find God's help. When we read scriptures, we find God's assistance. When we read scriptures, we find God's consolation and comfort. The only way we can ever defeat the enemy is by God's help. Nobody has been able to defeat the devil or the enemy without the help of God before. And thank God, God is a God of all comfort. Which means, when I read the scriptures, I see how God comes to the assistance of people. I see it clearly. So when God is on your side, you can only win. Glory to God. When God is only on your side, you can only win. Can somebody say with me very loud, God is on my side. And when he's on your side, you can only win. Can somebody shout, I win all the time. Because God is on my side all the time. Glory to God. So God is always on your side. Now, he could be against something you have done. The only reason why he's against something you have done is because he is on your side. The only reason why God can be against something you have done that is not right is because God is on your side. Always on your side. He will rebuke you when you do wrong, no doubt. But he is always on your side even when rebuking you. He will correct you when you have done wrong. But even in that correct, it is because he is always on your side. So know some people... You know, when they preach, they present a God that can be available, you know, on the transfer market. That is, the devil can buy God over. They present a God that always takes sides with Satan. A God that is bio bipolar. A God that is good, small, bad, small, evil, small, righteous, small. You know, a God that is mentally agitated. A God that lacks consistency of character. A God that is double-minded. You know, what, what a wickedness. God himself says, if you are double-minded, you cannot receive any good thing from him. Then preachers present a God who is double-minded. Sometimes he's good, sometimes he's bad. A very unstable God, a God you cannot rely on, a God you cannot trust, a God you don't know when he's happy and when he's angry, a God you don't know when he's thinking of doing good and when he's thinking of doing bad. What a God preachers have presented a mutilation of God's character. But one thing is sure, the Bible clearly paints to us a picture of a God that can be relied upon. A God that you can trust. A God that you know is always on your side and always has your back. A God you know that is always willing to help, always looking for how to help you. Like I keep saying to people that I minister to for healing. God is not the one stopping you from getting healed. So you don't have to pray and beg him. You don't have to cry and, con and convince him. God is not keeping anything from you. It gives him pleasure to give you the kingdom. It is his will to see you healed. And he, he has made healing available. It is his will to see you, you know, enjoy the things that redemption has provided, including victory, and he has made it available. God is not going to make it available. He has already made it available. He said, he that seeketh findeth. He that knocketh, the door shall be open. He that asketh, receiveth. Oh, sure. He says, before you call, I will answer. God has already made all the provisions that we require to enjoy the fullness of our lives in Christ available to us. So God is not the one that is double-minded. It's just some preacher's minds that is double-minded. God doesn't switch sides. He is on your side. 
he doesn't switch sides at all he is consistently constantly constant he is good all the time his mercy endures forever he is good all the time his mercies endures forever he is the same yesterday the same today the same forever he does not he does not change he never changes he's consistently constantly constant which means you can rely on him you can even predict him because he never changes there is no shadow of turning with him so god can be relied upon and we can see god's character replicated in the person of jesus what jesus does is what god does jesus is the revelation of god to man jesus is the express image of god jesus is god made manifest he says what i see my father do i do so if i want to know how god operates i just look at jesus and Jesus' character is consistent good all the time always good always gracious always merciful he is the god of all comfort in romans chapter 15 verse 4 where we started reading he says we through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope we might have hope so if i see what god has done before it gives me hope i will therefore have an expectation that because god has done it before and he never changes he will do it again so my expectation will be built on the fact that god is consistent the word el piso the word el piso something to look forward to hope is not something at the distance or something far away hope simply means i can expect this so when i look into the word of god i can expect this when i look into the word of god and i see god has done it before for somebody i can expect him to do it for me that's where hope is established for example psalm 107 verse 20 psalms 107 verse 20 mm -mm. he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions let's read a few pretexts and post texts start from verse 15 to 25 let's read psalm 107 15 to 25 oh that man will praise the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men for he had broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted their soul abhorred all manner of meat and they draw near unto the gates of death then they cry unto the lord in their trouble and he severed them out of their distresses he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction so this scripture is not for physical healing of the body is deliverance from iniquities and from the consequences of sin next verse all oh, that man will praise the lord the lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men and let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing that they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters next verse this see the works of the lord and his wonders in the deep next for he commandeth and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves thereof so i wanted to see that that scripture he sent his word his word healed them is not exactly for healing the sick but it shows you that god heals i have seen god heal i have seen miracles and this scripture i'm showing you is theologically and gram grammatically not referring to the healing of our bodies but god still healed god is not waiting for you to know scriptures for him to heal you god is not waiting for you to quote scriptures for him to heal you god is not waiting for you to rightly divide the word of truth for him to heal you he's a healer and he heals he wants to heal all the time it is his will to see you in a good condition in your health and you know just reading scriptures to see what god has done 
It's enough to see that God can do it again. He says, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now, how many of you know that you always have hope as a child of God? Always. You are begotten again unto a lively hope. Your Christian faith is a faith that is full of hope. Always there is hope for the child of God. Hopelessness is antichrist. You cannot be in Christ and say you are hopeless. How? You cannot be in Christ and say you are hopeless. Just take your Bible and read it. When you read it, you see that there's nothing new happening to you. Nothing new under the sun. And if there's nothing new happening, it means that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Whatever you're going through today, somebody went through it yesterday in scripture and God showed up. Which means it's guaranteed that he will show up in your case because there's no shadow of turning with him. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. S say with me, I have hope in Christ Jesus. Say it again very loud. I have hope in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. So you must always have expectation. There is no situation so bad that God will say, Oh, more. Hmm. this is a very serious matter. Oh. This situation is very complicated. There is no such situation. The Bible opens up with a very hopeless situation. In the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse number 2. Genesis chapter 1 verse number 2. And the earth, Genesis 1, 2, not 1, 1. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Next verse. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The, the earth was without form, void, and darkness is the Hebrew word tohua bohua. It means nothing, nothing. And what was God's solution to that hopeless situation? God simply spoke, let there be light. And there was light. It appears the very first work of God in scripture was to turn what was going wrong right. To turn what was going wrong right. That was the very first work of God in scripture from the way it's recorded. So usually when people paint a picture, like God only expect perfect situations. I laugh at them. Because that's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible specializes in dealing with imperfect situations. That is where he walks. He specializes in dealing with imperfect situations. That is why we have a story of redemption. That is why we have a story of salvation. If things were always perfect, the Bible would not have so many stories it has today. So it has so many stories because this story shows God's character in the midst of darkness. It shows God's character in the midst of the storm. Whenever you see God do it somewhere, it's an indication that he is willing to do it again and again for you. We read the scriptures that Jesus was in a boat traveling with the disciples. And there was a storm. And Jesus was sleeping. And the disciples were panicking because the storm was boisterous. It was about to capsize the, the ship and destroy all of them. And they woke Jesus up and said, Master, carry us down not that we perish. Jesus stood up. He rebuked the wind. He shows you that God is always ready and willing to help. He rebuked the wind. He rebuked the waves. And he commanded, peace, be still. And there was a great calm. Then he turned to the disciples and began to correct them. God is always willing to help. I don't know what dark night you are in right now. I don't know what storm of life you are going through. I don't know what circumstances of life has molested, embarrassed you. I don't know what things have overwhelmed you so that you're so depressed that you lose the joy of living. You're so depressed that life looks like darkness to you. Going through life is painful. 
You wake up in the morning, it, it's sadness throughout the day. You're no more looking forward to many years of being on earth. You feel like going through this world is full of gloom and darkness. I have news for you tonight. God is the God of all comfort. God is the God of consolation. And as a child of God, you must remember, he has done it again and again, and this time around, it will not be different. Therefore, right now, as we get into this world, and as we are looking at God's character, I speak to that storm, I speak to that crisis, I speak to that situation you're going through right now, I rebuke the wind, I rebuke the waves, Satan, get your hands off, I speak peace to your situation, I speak peace to that marriage, I speak peace to that business, I speak peace to that career, I speak peace to that circumstance, I speak peace to that health, Satan, get your hands off, in the name of Jesus, I command your body healed, I command your circumstances corrected, receive a miracle of God's power, in the name of Jesus, he is called the God of all comfort, he is called the God of all consolation, he doesn't come late. He is never in a hurry. But he's always on time. Oh yeah, he's always on time. He shows up on time. He shows up on time. You're not a hopeless person. You are begotten again to a lively hope. You have the joy of salvation. The joy of salvation. The consolation of God. The comfort of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. See, I and you must always have hope. Once you see that God did it anywhere in the Bible, it's an indication that he's available to do it for you. All you need to do is just, 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 just demand it and receive it. Whatever you teach, I always tell preachers, whatever you teach from the Bible, the constant vibe of scripture, and forgive me for that slang that I put in there, the constant vibe of scripture is always to make you believe. So which means therefore that the word of God is positive. The word of God is positive. It shows us possibilities. Even when you have sinned and things go bad. We have the nation of Israel as an example. Over and over. We have God's own servants. We have men of God in the Bible. We have a Samson. God never abandoned him. In spite of all that happened around him. We have a David. God never abandoned him. We have a Solomon. You will always find hope. Even in the midst of disobedience and rebellion. You will always. God never switches sides. God's word brings hope. And that's how we must read scripture. There's always hope for God's people. Because God is a God of comfort and hope. That's who he is. Interestingly, in 1 Corinthians 10, we find Brother Paul talking to another church entirely. Of course, he has told them that the church, they are carnal. They work as mere men. And he says to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now, all these things happen unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We saw that that word admonition is the word caution. The word admonition means caution. Talking about the Exodus story. Now watch this. Why will God's word give hope and also give caution? Why will God's word give hope and also give caution recall in genesis chapter 2 god is speaking to adam of course he says to him of every three of the garden that mayest freely eat the word freely eat there is where we have the concept of grace then he says but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it the day you eat of it you will surely die. Now, you discover that with hope and faith, there is always a warning. With hope and faith, there is always a warning. The warning is not that God is showing his bigness. So he gives you a warning. Be careful. Be careful. No. 
God's warnings are not to prove any point. Whatever warnings he gives us are to protect us. The warnings are to protect us. You know, I can use that illustration to bring, drive this point home. I got, I got me, somebody blessed me with a brand new Samsung phone some time back. Very beautiful Samsung phone. And then I, I, I didn't read the manual. There is a manual, very big manual. The manual is full of caution and warning. And the reason for the manual along with the phone is to help you maximize the phone and protect it. But I didn't read the manual. I dumped the manual, I just took the phone, I was excited. And I know many of you are in the same boat with me. Nobody wants to read the manual. So I traveled to another country to go and preach. And I got there and I discovered that I didn't carry my charger. I mean, that is the head that fits into that country's charging. I didn't have it. But I wanted to speak home. I wanted to call home and let them know I've, you know, I've arrived and everything is fine. And we couldn't find and it was night. And the people had gone. And I didn't want to stay till the following day before I speak to my family. And because it was quite a flight. So in the night, I decided to, to violate the, 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 the caution on the manual, which I never read. I pull off the head of the phone. I pull out the, the cables, the wires. I remove, you know, whatever, you know, covered the wires. I brought them out naked. And I inserted them directly into the sockets. And as I turned the light on, it exploded my phone. So now I can't even call, even if they get me the right charger. I can't do anything, the phone is gone. I can't even call home except I'm going to buy a new phone. Why? Because I ignored the manual. I ignored the caution. I decided to do my own thing. And I ended up destroying the phone. And it affected my stay and affected my comfort. So when warnings and caution is given... It's not to intimidate you. It's not to make you uncomfortable. Rather, it is to protect you. It is to protect you. It's the same way you have a little child and you engage the child lock. It's not to display power. When you put your child in the car and you use the child lock to lock the door. It's not to display power, but to protect. So when God gives us an admonition, it's not to show his power. And stop us from doing something to us. Like be careful. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. If not I will show you my colors. No. The caution has to do with a locking danger. He is not the danger. But he's protecting us from danger. So when God gives us caution. It is for our protection. See. God's control is not to show his power. God's control is in his power. Actually, to protect us from going out of his power. That is why he cautions us. That is why God cautions us. So if there's a caution at all in scripture, it's so that we walk in victory. The reason for caution is to make us win. The reason for caution is to deny the devil access to attack us. So that he doesn't get to harm us. So he is cautioning us so that we receive his comfort and not go astray. God is cautioning us so that we receive his comfort and not go astray. When God warns about hell, he's not warning about hell because he is going to destroy you. He is warning about hell because hell simply means the absence of his protect, protection and the absence of his saving power. Hell means the absence of God's protection and the absence of his saving power. So when he says these are written for our admonition, it means the word of God is meant to caution us. So when you hear thou shall not, yes, it gives glory to God, but it's for your good. It's for your sake. 
You see, obeying God doesn't make him bigger. Obeying God doesn't make God bigger. Obeying God doesn't make God greater. <laughs> obeying God doesn't make God good. He is God all by himself. He doesn't need your obedience to show that he is God. He is not proving a point. But as a loving father, he is cautioning you to protect you from harming yourself. He doesn't need a man to be the God that he is. So in obeying him, it doesn't make him bigger. It is not to make him more of God. Obeying God protects you. Obeying God protects you. Eventually, when you are protected, it gives him glory. So when the scripture says thou shalt not is because we believers are on the path to victory we believers are on the path to victory the thou shalt not is that we believers walk in victory it has nothing to do with okay god is scared of something happening to you no or he is going to do something bad to you no the bible teaches us things not to do the Bible teaches us things not to do. There are things a believer should not do. It means it's not healthy. Sometimes your doctors tell you what not to do to stay in optimal health. And when you ignore them, you come down with diseases. When God cautions you, it's so that we can walk in victory. Is a caution born out of love to protect those he loves. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 verse number 6. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. Be careful for nothing. The word be careful, another translation calls it be anxious. Be anxious. Okay. Let me ask you. Did he say be anxious for a few things? Huh? No. Did he say be anxious for most things? No. Be anxious for nothing. Be careful for nothing the word careful some versions say anxious the reason is because what is anxiety is a thin line from being concerned anxiety is a thin line from being concerned listen the greek word here is mem now mem now m e r m n a o m e r m n a o it actually means to meditate upon something for something to be much on your mind or for something to be on your mind mem nao you are thinking about something a lot anxious anxiety look at matthew chapter 6 verse 25 see what jesus said therefore i say unto you take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink nor yet for your body what you shall put on it's not the life more than meat and the body than raiment take no thought for your life now, if Jesus says something five times, you need to pay attention. Look at that Matthew chapter 6 verse 27. Matthew chapter 6 verse 27. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Take no thought. Verse 28 of Matthew 6. 
And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. Why take ye thought? Look at verse 31. 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what without shall we be clothed? Then look at verse 34, the 51. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So five times Jesus speaks about worry. The word here means to worry. To be deeply thinking about something where you want to take care of it by thinking. Anxious. It says worry not. It's a caution. If it is not harmful to you, God will not say it. So everybody say with me very loud, worry and anxiety are dangerous to me. Say it again. Worry and anxiety are dangerous to me. See, they are not just dangerous to you. They are dangerous also to those around you. You must therefore know that in our part of victory, worrying and anxiety are not in our victory. They are not a part of our victory. Worry and anxiety are not in our voice of victory. Worry and anxiety is part of defeat. It's part of defeat. Panic. Anxiety. Worry. Anxiety attacks. Where you even get sick because you're so anxious. You lack peace. You lack joy. You lack calmness. You're so worked up. You're not even in control anymore. They are not good for you. That's why Jesus says, don't be anxious. Take no thought. In Matthew chapter 10 verse 19. Matthew 10 19. But when they deliver you up, take no thought. How or what you shall speak. For it shall be given to you in that same hour what you shall speak. Don't be anxious. When you are persecuted, don't even think of what to say. Don't worry about it. Look at Luke chapter 10 verse 41. Luke chapter 10 verse 41. Jesus answered and said unto her, Mata, Mata, thou art careful and troubled about many things. Thou art careful and troubled about many things. Here you have a fellow who is doing something. Doing good. Mata was doing good. So he discovered that the concept of worry is about priority. The concept of worry is about priority. Jesus is in their house and is about to preach. And she says, let me make something for pastor. She's in the kitchen. And Mary is there listening to Jesus. Scripture says she sat at his feet. Look at verse 38 and 39 of that Luke, um, Luke chapter 10. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. Next verse. And she had a sister called Mary which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. To sit at Jesus' feet means she submitted to his word and to his ministry. She is learning. But Martha is in the kitchen. Of course, she's definitely hearing the preaching. But definitely something takes preeminence there where she is cooking. She is very busy that she's not paying attention. So she's casually hearing what Jesus is saying. But Mary gives it rapt attention and gives it a priority. You find people active in church, active in departments, very busy in church. But you won't see them in Bible studies. They are always busy. They don't even have a note. 
They don't write anything. They have electric brain. When we are teaching, they are busy all over the place. Oh, no Bible study. So year in, year out, no spiritual growth. That is living a life of caring. A life of anxiety. A life of worry. People come to your church for house church. The husband is sitting and the wife is busy in the kitchen every time we gather in that house for house church. The wife is always busy in the kitchen or busy going in and going out, distracting herself and distracting everybody. No honor and respect for the gathering. She's so full of chaos, anxiety. She's living in disobedience. Or we are in that house church. The husband is busy with his small radio as if he has become a broadcaster. He's moving all over the house as if that news is yelling on radio, he even understands it. He's just busy in himself. He can't sit down and hear the word. Bad attitude. Bad attitude. People are coming to your house and getting blessed. You, the host, it doesn't show on you because of bad attitude. Careful about many things. One thing is needful. And your sister has chosen the better path. One thing is needful. And your sister has chosen the better path that shall not be taken away from her. So anxiety is about what is of priority. For example, Jesus is saying, don't think about what you will wear. So is he saying you should dress like a clown? No. Something must be first. Don't think about what you shall eat. There are things you think of, and when those things are in place, what you shall eat naturally follows. Seek first the kingdom of God. So which means that the overruling thought in your mind should not be your material comfort. The overruling thought in your mind should not be your material comfort. The overruling thing in your mind should be the word of God, the plan of God for your life, the purpose of God for your life, and how to fulfill it. Worry. What shall we eat? What shall we wear? Okay. That shouldn't be the dominant thought in your mind. You keep thinking about it till you are depressed. Now when you sleep, all you are seeing is clothes in the dream, even though there's none physically. You're so obsessed. Now there's a thin line, like I said, between worry and care. And we shall look at that very carefully on Sunday in the first service. There's a thin line between legitimate concern and worry. If we say, how are we going to, you know, how are we going to fix this place? And somebody says, well, there's a brother there who will fix it. But then again, we can say, are we going to fix this? And then you say, you, say, you know, it'll it, it be so bad. I don't know how we're going to fix it. I don't know when we shall fix it. I don't know if we can fix it. Now, you, you, make, it, you make it an overwhelming, a dominant thought in your mind. It becomes worry. It becomes anxiety. It becomes a hazard. It becomes a problem. It's no more a blessing. Can somebody shout, I refuse to worry. God has my back. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches in glory. I cast my cares upon the Lord. He cares for me. I subject my thoughts to the authority of God's word. I think God's thoughts. I speak God's words. I meditate God's words. And I declare my needs are met supernaturally according to his riches in glory. Worry does not have space in my life. I thought somebody would shout glory. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Look at that Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 as I round off this service. We continue Sunday first service. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6. 
Glory to God. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Next verse. And the peace of God. Hallelujah. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Next verse. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on this thing. He tells you what not to think about. He tells you what not to worry about. And he tells you what to think about. Think on things that are pure, things that are just, things that are lovely, things that are honest, things that are of virtue and of praise, things that are of good report. It's been a while I've not sung that song. Tell up ye saints of God, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing to make you feel afraid. Nothing to make you doubt. Remember God has never failed, so why not trust him and say, you will be sorry you worry at all. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning. You will be sorry you worry at all tomorrow morning. Cheer up. The day today has enough for itself. His mercies are new every morning. Cheer up. Win the victory of today. Enjoy the moment. Enjoy where you are. On the way to where you're going. It's true you may not have what you need for tomorrow. But you have for today. Be grateful for today. Celebrate today. And somehow, somehow you will find out that there was no need to worry at all. Glory to God. Glory to God. No need to worry at all. Cast your cares on the Lord for he cared for you. Glory to God. He cared for you. He thinks about you. He's got you on his mind. And whatever has been harassing you and stopping you from experiencing the victory that is yours in Christ Jesus. Cast those worries on the Lord. Cast those cares on the Lord. And remember that our God is the God of all comfort. Glory to God. Stand on your feet. That's all I've got for you tonight. Hallelujah. He's the God of all comfort. The God of all patience. He's the God of all grace. And the Bible tells us that he will comfort you so that you can, with that comfort, comfort others. Father, I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice tonight. In the house here, in the house churches, on television, on radio. Those that are hearing the sound of my voice on social media. I rebuke the voice of harassment, the voice of worry. I come against panic. I come against pressure, depression, oppression. Satan, lose your holes in the name of Jesus. And I command God's healing power, God's miracle power. I speak peace over your thoughts, over your mind, over your heart. I speak peace over your home. Satan, get your hands. Get your hands off in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for your power. There's no distance in the realm of the spirit. Thank you, Lord. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him out of them all. I command you to come out of every affliction. Come out of every harassment. Come out of every panic. Come out of every pressure. Come out of every anxiety. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you can handle. And he will, with the temptation, make a way of escape. That is your way of escape. Receive in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Supernaturally, things are turning all over the place around and creating space for your victory to manifest. So we receive victory on your behalf in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Glory! Amen! 
Whoa, I tell you people, I tell you people, I tell you people. If God did it before, it's an indication he will do it again. Whenever you read the scriptures and you see what God has done, he healed, he delivered, he restored, he delivered from death, he delivered from disaster. He rescued and delivered and he worked signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. When you see all of those records, they are written there for you to see. that that is what God did before. And that capacity and willingness is still within him to do it for you. If you will dare to just demand and take delivery of it, you walk in the victory that he has provided. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Time for us to give our honor offerings tonight as we worship Jesus. You have your honor offering, put it together, radio audience. It's Power City International, you want to give and support what we do. We do. You want to give and support the preaching of the gospel all over the nations of the earth. It's Power City International. FCMB 298268. 2028. 298268. 2028 Zenith Bank 10 12 that is 6 59 12 10 12 that is 6 59 and 12 now we're so grateful for having you here on our platform kindly hit the subscribe button if you are new here and also like this message for us do well to comment in the comment section because we want to know what you learned and where you're watching us from. Thank you, Message Community.